So this is the video lecture for chapter 14, where we're going to be discussing DNA structure and function. Um, and just as a, a heads up, uh, some of this recording was taped last semester, and so there might be some references that don't really fit our class. So just bear with me, um, ignore those, and just focus on the content. Okay, so um, we're talking about DNA, and before we get into structure, what it's made of, and function, what it does, I want to first kind of a, uh, let you know about some different DNA technologies, and we were supposed to do some of these in lab, and unfortunately, um, we won't be able to get into these too much. We're, you're going to have um, some assignments where you're going to be looking at some DNA technology, but um, actually hands-on, um, unfortunately, we won't get to. So pictured here in, um, in this nice uh, photograph is Dolly. She was the first large mammal to be cloned. Um, let me just grab my pointer here. So using uh, modern day uh, DNA technological approaches, um, recombinant DNA technology and cloning was used to produce Dolly. Uh, we are able to clone other things as well. Cloning in cell culture is very, very common, very, very easy to carry out, um, and other mammals have been cloned since Dolly. So not only can we use DNA technology to clone things, so to make identical copies of cells or of whole organisms, we also have um, some more practical applications of DNA technology that we use all the time. So for example, in forensics, we use DNA technology. Um, if we're at a crime scene and we find uh, a little bit of DNA or a little bit of some other type of bodily fluid, um, whether it's blood or, or some type of bo bodily fluid, we, we can extract DNA from that. Uh, we can amplify it using a, um, a DNA technology called PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. And then we can uh, cut up the DNA using um, restriction endonucleases or restriction enzymes. And then we can run that DNA in a gel and we can compare DNA from, for example, a crime scene um, to suspect DNA. And we can figure out maybe who was at the crime scene. Uh, we can also use DNA technology in paternity testing. Same idea, you would take genetic information, so DNA from the child as well as two parents. And you can look at the banding pattern that's produced when we do a, a, a gel. And if the banding, banding pattern of the child matches um, the two parents, uh, that's a pretty good indication of paternity. Um, and there are other ways that we can look at that as well. Genealogy, so figuring out who's related to who, looking at family trees. Uh, we use DNA technology in vaccine development. And we also use DNA technology looking at disease susceptibility. Um, we can pull out DNA from an individual and we can look for specific genes that would indicate whether that individual is going to be at a higher likelihood uh, to get certain types of diseases like cancer and diabetes, um, um, diseases like hemochromatosis. My father actually had hemochromatosis. It's a genetic disorder in which you have to actually inherit, I think it's 13 different recessive allele. So he was homozygous recessive at 13 different locations. Um, and so he had this genetic disorder. It's called hemochromatosis. And what happened in him is his body had the inability to break down iron. And so iron would build up in his red blood cells, eventually get deposited into organs. And if it wasn't caught, he could have went into organ failure. They did catch it. Um, the treatment for that is pretty archaic. Um, they would remove about a pint of blood from him uh, every week or every couple of weeks to just kind of remove iron from the body. So again, a genetic disorder um, uh, that we can tell just by looking at DNA. Pretty neat. So we know what um, a chromosome is, right? We studied chromosomes back in chapter uh, 11. Uh, we started them last semester as well. So chromosomes in eukaryotes like us, like humans, um, are going to be linear. We're going to find in a little while, we get a little bit further on this lecture, that bacteria also have DNA. They also have um, really a chromosome one, and their chromosome is circular. So genes uh, will be found in a linear order, um, but that could be on a linear chromosome or on a circular chromosome. Okay, in any, in any event, they're found um, in a line, so one gene after another. 
uh, what is a gene exactly? A gene is going to be made up of DNA, right? And it's going to be a linear sequence of nucleotides. And so remember those bases, A, T, C, and G, we're going to get there in a minute. Um, how they are arranged is going to tell us what exactly that sequence, that gene codes for. It'll tell us what the product of that gene will be, right? And it, the product of most genes is going to be proteins, um, but RNA actually comes first. We know that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and so if you kind of take a look at all those chromosomes and you figure out um, uh, exactly what their length is, what we found is that the human genome is about 6 billion base pairs in length. And when you do the math, uh, we think that there's about 20 to 25,000 functional genes within those 6 billion base pairs. Okay. So we did this study um, where we did a couple, yeah, we, we looked at these, these uh, studies and a couple of other ones. Uh, we'll just briefly review them really quick. So first off, the first scientists to um, discover that genetic information existed was back in the 1860s. This was Friedrich Meischer, and he was studying white blood cells, which are called leukocytes. And he identified this material but um, he didn't call it DNA, instead he called it nuclein. He wasn't sure what it was um, composed of, um, but he thought that maybe um, this had something to do with uh, traits. And, and then in the early 1900s, Thomas Hunt Morgan's lab was actually doing some genetic studies, and what they found out is that genes are arranged in a linear order. So if you remember back when we did chapter 12 and we talked about um, chromosome mapping and how we can actually figure out the order based on recombination frequency, all of that came out of Morgan's lab. And so um, at that time, what Morgan's lab has sh showed us is that chromosomes um, are going to be made up of genes arranged in a linear fashion. And what we knew at that point was that chromosomes were made up of DNA and protein but we didn't know which one was actually the genetic material. So that was the looming question of that day. And so here's Griffith's experiments. So in 1928, uh, Friedrich Griffith and, and his lab, right, all of his graduate students, they performed transformation experiments. And so I want to make sure that you know what transformation means. Transformation is the uptake of genetic information into an organism and that organ that organism will then um, incorporate that genetic information into its own genome and will express it under the right conditions. So how did he do this? Um, he took uh, bacteria, okay, and the bacteria that he used was Streptococcus pneumoniae. And Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, comes in two different strains. Uh, one of them is pathogenic and one of them is not pathogenic. Okay, so the smooth or S streptococcus pneumoniae were pathogenic or disease causing, where the rough, which we're gonna call the R strain, does not cause disease, so they're non-pathogenic. Okay, and this is how they did it. They also used mice. And so as you can see in the first experiment here, um, Griffith had a test tube where he was growing non-pathogenic streptococcus pneumoniae. He injected that into mice. He came back you know, a few days later and the mice were perfectly happy and fine. Second experiment. He takes his S cells. So these are going to be the virulent or disease causing or pathogenic bacteria. He injects them into mice. Mice die. Okay, that all makes sense. In experiment three, he took the same um, disease-causing pathogenic streptococcus pneumoniae, and this time he exposed them to heat. So we call, that, we call that heat killing. And so everything inside this tube now is dead. He took those dead bacterial cells, injected them into the mouse, and the mouse lives. That makes sense. Here is the most important part of this experiment, right? Here's where it is. So here he has the heat-killed, non-disease-causing S cells, and he's going to incubate those with the non-pathogenic R cells. And what he found when he injected mice with this cocktail, this mixture, is that these mice died. And so what was happening here? Something from this tube 
was getting assimilated or taken up by the bacteria in this cell, <coughs> in this tube, and was causing them to die. And so again, that assimilation, that uptake of information, again, we didn't know yet if it was DNA or protein, into these cells, allowing them to change and to express that genetic material, that's called transformation. The looming question still though, that Griffith did not answer, was what was it? Was it DNA or was it protein? And so in 1944, another group of scientists, Avery, Cloyd, and McCarty, they took Griffith's work a step further. What they did here is they isolated um, the pathogenic, right, S strain bacteria from the dead mice. Okay, so they took mice and they um, injected them with pathogenic bacteria. They died. They pulled out those bacteria from the dead mice. They broke open those bacteria and they isolated the component parts of that bacteria. So they separated out proteins from nucleic acids. And they asked the question, was it the protein component or was it the nucleic acid component, component from the bacteria that caused transformation? So they redid these experiments. They took the non-pathogenic bacteria and they incubated them with the proteins from the pathogenic bacteria. They put that then into mice and what they found is the mice lived. So it wasn't proteins. Then they took the nucleic acid portion from the pathogenic bacteria, incubated that with the non-pathogenic bacteria, and took that cocktail and put that into mice and the mice died. And so they, from these studies, concluded that it must have been the nucleic acids that were causing the transformation. It was DNA, the genetic information, and not the protein that was doing the transforming. Okay, so scientists needed further confirmation, right? It wasn't enough that we had these studies so far. And so in 1952, some more experiments were done. These were done by Martha Chase and Alfred Hershey. They're known as the famous Hershey-Chase experiments. Different model system here. Instead of using bacteria and mice, they used bacteriophages. So that's these little alien looking like things here. And they used bacteria, E. coli. Um, and so bacteriophages, these are gonna be viruses that infect bacteria, okay? Um, and they operate like other viruses. They're going to hijack a host cell and take over that host cell uh, in order to replicate themselves. And so if we take a look at the bacteriophage, it's pretty simple. So it's made up of really two components. There is DNA, which is on the inside, and that DNA is surrounded by a protein coat. Okay, so everything out here that's kind of covering up uh, or, or encapsulating that area where the DNA is, even these little feet-like structures, that is all protein. This little bit of green here being injected into the cell you can see it here and here and here from this virus. That is all genetic material, so that's all DNA. Okay, so again, the question was, is it protein or is it DNA? Um, that is going to be the, model, the, the molecule of inheritance, the genetic material. So a very simple experiment that they did. So here we go. They took bacteriophage virus, and they had two batches. One batch is shown up here, and the second batch is shown down here. And so one batch of their bacteriophages, they radioactively labeled with P32. Okay, so this is radioactive phosphorus. And if we remember back to what DNA looks like, we're going to get into that structure a little bit more here. We talked a little bit about it um, before we broke for, for spring break in the lab as well. Remember the sugar phosphate backbone. So there's a lot of phosphorus atoms within a molecule of DNA. And so this radioactive P32, this is going to label all DNA um, as radioactive. Okay, the protein would not be. And then down here in this batch, instead of using P32, they used radioactive sulfur, so S35. And this sulfur is going to be found in the protein and not in the DNA. Okay, so they had one batch of bacteriophage where they radioactively labeled DNA, and a second batch where they radioactively labeled the protein. Okay, so now they incubated um, the DNA labeled uh, bacteriophage uh, with bacteria and they allowed the bacteria to infect 
or sorry, they, they allowed the bacteria to be infected by the bacterial phage. So that's this. And then here at the bottom, they, they did the same thing. So they took the radioactively labeled um, uh, bacteriophages that had their proteins labeled, and they incubated them with bacteria to allow infection. They then took um, these cultures and they put them into a blender. Why did they do that? The blender would shake these cells, and so anything on the surface would get knocked off, and anything inside would remain. Okay, and so then what did they do? They took um, the bacteria as well as anything that was on the outside that fell off, and they put it into a fresh tube, and they spun it in a centrifuge. And so a centrifuge is going to be a machine which is going to spin these samples at pretty high speeds, allowing uh, these researchers to separate the, the, the phage from the bacteria. So anything that was on the surface that fell off would end up up here in the, in the supernatant, and the bacteria would be down here in what we call the pellet. And then they looked. They actually grew these bacteria out, and they looked for radioactivity. And they didn't find any radioactivity down here, but they did here. And so what this told us is that the DNA that was labeled here ended up getting into these cells and then ended up being replicated here in these bacteria. And that the protein here labeled in red, right, the S35, did not get into these bacterial cells. And so this was knocked off and it ended up up here. And so when we go to grow these bacteria at the bottom, there is no radioactivity in them. Right, the radioactivity was up here. So again, pretty um, nice experiment. Again, this confirmed that DNA and not proteins was the molecule uh, that carries genetic information. Okay, around the same time that that work was being done, so in the 1940s, there was another scientist named Erwin Shargoff, and he was looking at and analyzing DNA uh, from a multitude of different organisms, so many different species. And he started to look at um, the content of the uh, bases. And so uh, we know now that there's four nucleic acids or four different bases found in, in DNA. And those are A, T, C, and G, right? Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And what Shargoff found when he did these studies is that there was always an equal amount of adenine and thymine. And then there was always an equal amount of cytosine and guanine. But the amount of A and C, or A and G, was not the same, as well as the amount of T and C, or T and G, were not the same. It was always A and T had about the same percentage, and C and G would have the same amount as well. So we call that Shargoff's rule. Um, and so from that, he figured out that it must be that adenine is somehow going to bind with or pair with thymine, and cytosine is always going to bind with or bond with or pair with guanine. And so this is our rule, A to T, C to G. And you probably remember me saying a couple weeks back in, in lab, uh, A to T2, C to G3. So as we go into looking at structure, adenine always is going to um, Form a, form a double hydrogen bond with thymine, and between C and G there will always be three hydrogen bonds. Okay, so before I go any further, you want to make sure that you go ahead and you answer this, are you with me? So I would pause this right here and go ahead and answer those, and when you're finished, uh, we will continue. A couple of questions before we get to the next section. So here we go. So first one, the experiments of Hershey and Chase helped confirm that DNA was the hereditary material on the basis of finding that, was it uh, red? Radioactive sulfur was found in the pellet. Blue, radioactive cells were found in the supernatant. Okay, the pellet would be on the bottom of that tube and the supernatant would be all the liquid on top of that pellet. Or radioactive sulfur was found inside of the cells. 
or radioactive phosphorus was found inside the cell. So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Pause me if you need more time. Hopefully you answered yellow. Okay, so when they found radioactive phosphorus inside of the cells, that was, an, uh, that was evidence that DNA, which contains a sugar phosphate backbone, right, that phosphorus was, was, was uh, being radioactively labeled. So that DNA made its way into the cell, okay? Um, not the protein, right, because the radioactive sulfur was what was labeling proteins. Okay, so again, the answer would be yellow. Radioactive phosphorus was found in the cell. The next question, bacterial transformation is a major concern uh, in many medical settings. Okay, so remember transformation is the uptake of foreign DNA. Why might healthcare providers be concerned? So pink, pathogenic bacteria could introduce disease-causing genes into non-pathogenic bacteria. Blue, antibiotic resistant resistance genes could be introduced to new bacteria to create superbugs. Green, bacteriophages could spread DNA encoding toxins to new bacteria. Or yellow, all of the above. And so hopefully you answered yellow, all of the above would definitely be true. Next question. If DNA of a particular species was analyzed, and it was found that it contains 27% A, or adenine, what would the percentage of C, or cytosine, be? Okay, so you gotta do the math there. You have to know your base pairing rules. Give you a couple seconds to do that math. Okay, so hopefully your answer was green, 23%. Okay, and again, how did we figure that out? So think about the base pairing rules, A to T, C to G. So if 20% of the DNA is adenine, that means there has to be an equal amount of thymine, right? Because A to T. So for every um, adenine base, that's going to be paired with a thymine base. And so if there's 27% adenine, there has to also be 27% thymine. Those have to be equal. And so 27 and 27 uh, is 54, okay? So 54% of the bases are either A or, or T. And so how much is C and G? You do 100 minus 54, that's 46. And so half of that would be guanine and half of that would be cytosine. And so half of 46 is 23. Okay, so if you know the base pairing rules, hopefully you could figure that out. Next question. Griffith's studies showed that hereditary material could be taken up, assimilated, and expressed by an organism. That process is known as, is it transcription, or translation, or transformation, or transfusion? I'll give you a second to think about that. Okay, and hopefully you chose transformation. So the uptake, assimilation, and expression of foreign DNA is called transformation. Uh, and in a few weeks in lab, we'll be doing this. Well, I'll be doing it. You'll be watching. Um, and you'll be, you'll be analyzing results of a transformation experiment. Okay, this is the last question. So Avery and colleagues extended Griffith's work by showing that pink, mice injected with pathogenic bacteria die, blue, it was DNA and not protein that was the transforming agent, green, it was protein and not DNA that caused transformation, or yellow, DNA replication occurs before cell division. And so hopefully your answer here was blue. It's DNA, not proteins, that, that was the transforming agent. Okay, so let's go on to the next section. Okay. So we know that 
DNA is the molecule of inheritance. And so now let's take a closer look at nucleic acids. There's actually two types. There's DNA and there's RNA. And DNA is going to usually be the molecule of heredity. So that gets passed from parent to offspring. And when I say usually, um, there are some organisms, viruses, which really aren't living organisms, but that some viruses are RNA um, based. And so what that means is that their molecule of heredity is actually RNA. Kind of interesting. Um, but for prokaryotes and eukaryotes, animals, plants, bacteria, uh, anything that we're going to be studying, uh, DNA is going to be that molecule of heredity. So this is the information that's going to be passed from parent to offspring, and it codes for um, everything that makes us us, right? So all of our traits are coded for in our DNA. RNA is going to be involved in gene expression. If you remember central dogma, we're going to get farther into that in the next chapter, in chapter 15. Um, but for now, we're going to look just at RNA structure. So DNA is the molecule of inheritance, and RNA is going to be the molecule um, that is going to be involved in expression of those genes. So we're going to learn about transcription, and we'll learn about translation. That involves RNA. The building blocks of both DNA and RNA are called nucleotides. And so both DNA and RNA are polymers, right? And they're made up of these repeating subunits that we call monomers. And those monomers are nucleotides. All nucleotides consist of three pieces, three parts. The first is a nitrogenous base. So that's a nitrogen containing base. And those bases, we know them already, A, T, and C, and G, and U for, for RNA. Those are the bases. We'll get into those farther in a second. The second thing is a five carbon sugar. And in DNA, that five carbon sugar is called deoxyribose. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And in RNA, the sugar is called ribose. In both cases, both deoxyribose and ribose, those are both five carbon sugars. And lastly, each nucleotide is made up of a phosphate group, okay? Before we go any further, I want to just let you know that each nucleotide is going to be named according to the nitrogenous base. So if I say we have a nucleotide of adenine, uh, that's going to be composed of a phosphate group, a five carbon sugar attached to adenine. We call that an adenine nucleotide. Now, adenine and guanine are the larger bases. They're made up of two fused rings. And so we call those the purines. And cytosine, thymine, and uracil, these are gonna be the smaller, only single ring bases. And those are called the pyrimidines. Okay, remember again, that thymine is found in DNA, where uracil is found in RNA. This is the basic structure of a DNA nucleotide. So here's our phosphate group. This is two rings, so this is either adenine or guanine. I'll show you those on the next page. Okay, so every DNA nucleotide is composed of three parts, a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. Um, before we go any further, I think I'll just point out some things about this sugar. And so you're going to hear this three prime and five prime, um, um, these words, ignore this right here, I'm not sure what that is, this is three prime end. Um, if this were a nucleotide, right, and this was part of, a, of a, um, um, a chain of nucleotides, its orientation right now, how it, how it looks, it's running five prime to three prime. So the five prime carbon here is on top and the three prime carbon down here is on the bottom. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at that a little bit farther. You can also tell by the oxygen. If the oxygen is pointing up, this strand is running five prime to three prime. Okay, we'll come back to that. So here's what those bases look like, right? So here's adenine and here's guanine. These are the purines. You can see that they're made up of two fused rings each. And then the pyrimidines here, cytosine, thymine, and uracil, these are made up of just one ring, and so they're smaller. And remember that adenine is always going to hydrogen bond with thymine, A to T, and cytosine is always going to hydrogen bond with guanine. Okay. Okay. So we started to talk, we ended up here. We started to talk about Watson and Crick and their work 
um, and coming up with uh, the structure of DNA. They came up with um, the structure. Remember, I kind of told you about this, that um, Watson and Crick get the Nobel Prize, got the Nobel Prize in 1962. Um, unfortunately, the scientist who was responsible for this very famous photo here um, died by then. Her name was Rosalind Franklin. Um, but a lot of the work um, that helped Watson and Crick eventually come to their finding of, of uh, what the DNA structure was came out of Rosalind's lab. So unfortunately, she um, wasn't alive to actually um, get that kind of credit. Her, uh, the researcher that she worked under was a scientist by the name of Wilkins, and Wilkins also got credit for some of this work. You are actually going to be watching this video uh, that displays this story about Watson, Crick, Wilkins, and Franklin um, for lab this week. It's called DNA uh, Double Helix Discovery, the DNA Double Helix Discovery, and it's been produced by HHMI Biointeractive. It's a great video. Again, you'll be watching that in lab, but if you'd like to watch it uh, now, you can go ahead and pause this and, and go ahead and watch it. Um, it's our introductory video for lab this week. Um, so you can you can watch it twice, you can watch it once here, there, however you want to do it. But it's a really neat video showing uh, the relationship and kind of how this work was done. Okay, so after watching that video, this should just be kind of a review for you. Um, so we'll go over some basic uh, structures that we find in DNA. So first of all, DNA is double stranded. So it's made up of two strands. And the two strands are going to be joined in the middle by hydrogen bonding. And the two strands will then twist around each other, forming a helix. Okay, so it's a double-stranded helical molecule. If we look on the outside of the molecule, both strands on the outside, we're going to find a sugar phosphate backbone. And the middle is going to be where those bases are. And those bases will be held together by hydrogen bonds. So we're at A to T2, C to G3. The two strands are going to run anti-parallel to each other. So one strand will run three prime to five prime, and the other strand will run five prime to three prime. I'll show you that in a second. You probably saw that in the video as well. And here's some numbers that you should know. So 0 0.34, this is gonna be the distance between two consecutive base pairs within the double helix. 3.4 is the distance between 10 consecutive base pairs. It also equals one complete turn of that DNA double helix. And the width of the molecule, no matter where we are, anywhere on, on that molecule, if we were to measure the width, it's always a constant. It's 2.0 nanometers in width. Okay, and so you remember this from lab, right? And maybe some of you guys looked at this model and hopefully this looks familiar as well. And so look, here's the sugar phosphate backbone. Phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. Let me go to the other side of the molecule. Same thing, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. So on both sides, both strands, there's a sugar phosphate backbone. And in the center of the molecule is where we find the nitrogenous bases. So holding those together, these dotted lines here, those are hydrogen bonds. And so look, we have two hydrogen bonds here. This must be A and T. Adenine would be the double ring, and thymine would be the single. Here's three hydrogen bonds. Here's a double ring. This must be guanine. And here's a single ring. That's going to be cytosine. Okay, let's talk about 5' prime to 3'. prime. We'll come over here first. Look, these oxygens, they're pointing up. And so this strand here must be running five prime to three prime. We could also number the carbon. So here's my sugar, right? Here's my oxygen. If we go clockwise, this is carbon one, always attached to the base. Carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five. So it's running five to three. Five to three. If I go to my other strand here, notice the oxygens are pointing down. 
So that automatically tells us this is running 3 to 5. But I could also number my carbons again. So here's my oxygen. Carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 3 to 5. Okay, this five prime to three prime, or three prime to five prime, is gonna come into play again when we talk about DNA replication, um, as well as when we talk about transcription. And so we wanna make sure that we have a pretty good understanding of that. Again, from here to here is two nanometers. From here to here is 0.34 nanometers. And if we look at one complete turn of this molecule, or 10 base pairs, that'll be 3.4 nanometers. So just some numbers that you should know. I'll take a break, and I'm gonna ask you to answer these following Are You With Me questions. So just pause it and go ahead and, and uh, answer these. And here it says make a sketch. If you know how to do that digitally, awesome. If you don't, um, you can make a sketch for yourself, and then what you turn in um, can be just a description of what that looked like, okay? Importantly, if one strand, right, that I'm giving you here is this, what is the other strand gonna be look, gonna look like? Without drawing the sugar phosphate backbone, could you just tell me the sequence of the bases? Okay, so take a few minutes to do that. Okay, so just a couple of questions for you before we move on. So here's the first one. Uh, the DNA double helix does not does not have which of the following? Does it not have an anti-parallel configuration? Does it not have complementary base pairing? Does it not have a major and minor groove? Or does it not have the nitrogenous base uracil? So DNA is, it does run anti-parallel. The two strands are anti-parallel. Remember, that means that one strand runs 5 to 3, while the other strand will run 3 to 5, anti-parallel. Remember, that means that the sugars are flipped over, okay? We're talking about the, the carbon number. When we talk about prime, 5 prime, 3 prime, that's referring to the carbon number on the deoxyribose, okay? So they definitely do run anti-parallel. There is complementary base pairing, remember A to T2, C to G3. Um, in one complete turn or 3.4 nanometers of the double helix, um, we find a major and a minor groove. Um, and so the only one that doesn't fit here is uracil. Remember that uracil is only found in RNA, where thymine is found in DNA. Next question, the monomeric, sorry about my dog, <laughs> the monomeric building blocks of DNA and RNA are called, are they called backbone molecules, nucleic acids, amino acids, or nucleotides? So hopefully you answered yellow nucleotides. Sometimes students will say nucleic acids. Remember nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. Those are the two nucleic acids where a nucleotide is the building block of DNA or RNA. Remember a nucleotide consists of a phosphate group bonded to a sugar, whether it's ribose or deoxyribose, doesn't matter, bonded to a nitrogenous base, A, T, C, G, or U. Okay, that's a nucleotide. So three component parts, phosphate, sugar, base. Okay, there's the next question. <laughs> these building blocks, nucleotides, are made of these three components. Um, and here we're talking about DNA. Okay, we haven't gotten to RNA yet, um, I think. Well, let's just go through and read it. A phosphate group, a six carbon sugar, and a purine, or blue, a phosphate group, a five carbon sugar, and a nitrogenous base, green, a five carbon sugar, a nucleotide, and a base, or yellow, a two nanometer sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. So the answer here would be blue, and this, this holds true for both DNA or RNA. Okay, so we're gonna have a phosphate group covalently bonded to our five carbon sugar, which is then covalently bonded to our nitrogenous base. Okay, next question. The measurements 2.0 nanometer, 
and 0.34 nanometer represent the blank and the blank. So is it the width of the DNA and the distance between two consecutive base pairs, or the length of the DNA and the distance between two consecutive base pairs, or is it the distance between 10 base pairs and the distance between two base pairs, or the length of one turn and the width of the molecule? I'll give you a second to look at that one. So hopefully you answered pink, okay? So 2.0 nanometers is the width or the diameter of the DNA from one backbone to the other, okay? Um, and 0 0.34 is the distance between two consecutive bases on that ladder of DNA, okay? Two consecutive base pairs, I should say. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so our next spot here is to talk about DNA replication. And so we know that DNA is the molecule of heredity. So how does it get passed from parent to offspring? Right? We know about mitosis, one parent cell to two daughter cells, or meiosis, right? One parent cell to four um, haploid uh, cells. Um, how does this genetic information, we, we know before mitosis and meiosis happens, we know that this genetic information has to be copied. How does that happen? So that's what we're going to answer now. There were three different models that were suggested to explain how DNA gets copied. Those three models were the conservative model. Okay, and in the conservative model, what this said is that if this is our parent DNA, so we have two strands here, right? We're representing these parent strands using gray, okay? These two parent strands, after they're copied, the conservative model says that we'll have one parent molecule of DNA made up of both old or original DNA strands and one copy of DNA made up of just new DNA, represented by blue. The semi-conservative model that was proposed looks like this. So here my parent DNA made up of two gray strands or old strands, original strands. Those get separated and my two new DNA molecules are made up of one old and one new, one old and one new. And lastly, the third model that was proposed was called the dispersive model. And what this said is that when we look at daughter DNA, so here and here, that they are gonna be made up of a mixture, both strands, made up of a mixture of both old and new DNA. And so let's look at the study that was performed. Okay. So the model organism used in this study was E. coli. And this study was done by two scientists named Messelson and Stahl. Very famous experiment. A little bit difficult to understand. I'm gonna actually go here. Okay, so there's a verbal description here. Ooh, verbal description here. And then here, I'm gonna show you what's from your book and then this is from a past book, so we'll, we'll go through it a couple of times. Okay, so let's start here. So we've got E. coli. Okay, we've got E. coli, and we're going to grow them in the presence of nitrogen 15. Okay, and so we know that DNA is made up of nitrogenous bases, right? Bases that contain nitrogen. And so we could radioactively I'm sorry, we could, we could take nitrogen 15, which is radioactive nitrogen, um, and we can incorporate it, we can get the E. coli to grow and incorporate that nitrogen into its DNA, okay? And so that's what they did. They took E. coli and they grew them in the presence of nitrogen 15. And when they took E. coli from this tube, grown in the presence of nitrogen 15, uh, when they took the DNA and they separated it, on a density gradient, what they found is the DNA growing uh, in, the, in the bacteria that were growing in here, all of that DNA would end up down here in the density gradient. It was pretty dense. So all of the DNA ended up here. Okay, so if I take bacteria and I grow them in the presence of nitrogen 15 and I pull out their DNA, the DNA ends up down here. That's how they started. So the next thing that they did was they took 
um, some bacteria out of this flask and they put it into a new flask and that new flask contained light nitrogen so N14 a different isotope that was less dense and so they let that bacteria grow for about one round of DNA replication they isolated the DNA and again they separated it out on a density gradient so this is after one round of DNA replication and what they found is that DNA did not go down here instead it moved up all of the DNA they got one band and all of the DNA was around the middle of that density gradient and then they took that bacteria and they put some of it into a new flask and they let it grow for a second round of replication so out to generation number two again in the presence of just the light nitrogen and so after two rounds of DNA replication they came here right so this is round two or the second generation and what they found is that there was two bands now in the density gradient one band was here in the middle right where the band was from one generation but the second band that was formed was up here and they actually carried this out to the third and fourth and beyond and what they found is that with each round of replication there was a there was less DNA here in the center and more DNA up here at the top of that density gradient and the percentage would increase up here and it would decrease down here okay and so let's look at this okay here's another uh, uh, figure showing this again words are a little bit different but I, I like this one a little bit better because it actually shows the models so let's do it again so they had bacteria E. coli they were growing it uh, in a flask that contained heavy nitrogen N15 if they were to take these E. coli right now, right here in this flask, break them open, all of the DNA would go to the bottom of the centrifuge tube. They would get one band way down here at the bottom, okay? They then took some of those bacterial cells and put them in a new flask that only contained N14. And they let them grow one generation. So here's the results of that. After one round of replication, they got one band towards the middle of the tube. Okay, so which models fit here? Well, the semi-conservative model definitely fits. Because after one round of replication, if we go back, we would expect both of the daughter DNAs, right? So all of the DNA produced in that tube should be composed of one heavy strand and one light strand. So one strand of DNA from the parent, which would be all made up of all N15 bases, and one strand that would be new, made up of all N14 bases. So one heavy, one light. And the same thing over here, one heavy, one light. So these two strands would come apart, they would serve as templates, and new strands would be built off of them. So that makes sense. So all of the DNA going to the middle of the tube would definitely support that hypothesis, that model. Here's the strands of DNA, right? So if you look, they're made up of one old dark blue strand and one new light blue strand. The conservative model doesn't make sense at all, so we could put an X rate on there. If the conservative model were true, then what we'd expect after one round of replication is two bands, one way down here at the bottom representing the DNA made up of both, uh, both strands made up of heavy nitrogen, and then one band up here, both strands made up of light nitrogen. Let's go back real quick. See that? So in the conservative model, this would be the DNA of the original cell, right, made up of both strands made up of N15. And after replication, we would have one double-stranded molecule of DNA, both strands made up of N15 or old. And the new here, um, this double-stranded piece of DNA would be made up of all N15, or, sorry, N14. So this would go to the bottom, and this would be that band at the top. We didn't get that. Okay, we didn't get this. We got that. And so we can cross this off. 
The dispersive model, however, holds true so far. So in the dispersive model, that says that the two daughter DNA would be made up of both heavy and light, both new and old, both original and new. Um, and so we would end up with a band in the middle. Okay, so right there, we don't have evidence yet to get rid of the dispersive model. And so that's why, luckily, Messelson and Stahl took the bacteria here and they let them replicate out to a second generation. And when they did that, they found this. So in this tube right here, after two rounds of DNA replication, we've got a band here in the middle, which represents DNA made up of both heavy and light. And up here at the top, this would represent DNA made up of two strands containing just light nitrogen. And so that makes sense here. Okay, so this is the semi-conservative model. So what would have happened was both of these strands of DNA, both of them would have come apart and would have served as templates. And so you'd have your two original blue or heavy strands here, each with a new strand. So this is N15 and N14, N15 and N14. And then this band up here would be made up of the light strands from these serving as templates for these. So you end up with two with both new or both light. So that makes sense. The dispersive model does not. And so what would have happened if these came apart and new strands were built, right? you would end up with still this dispersion of both heavy and light nitrogen throughout all four new DNA strands. And so what would have happened was this band would have shifted slightly up, but you wouldn't end up with two distinct bands like you did. Okay, so that's being shown here. That band just kind of shifts up a little bit. And so based on the Messelson and Stahl experiments, the semi-conservative model for DNA replication, again, holds true. I put some more reference videos uh, within that folder for you if this model is still not clear, so you can take a peek at those. Okay, so basically what the semi-conservative model says is if this is your parent DNA, right, it's double-stranded, right, sugar phosphate backbone is shown here, sugar phosphate backbone is shown here, and then we've got our nitrogenous bases in the center. So A to T, C to G, T to A. Okay, we've got hydrogen bonds in between those. And so what's going to happen during DNA replication is those two strands will become unzipped and separated. And they're going to serve as templates, which means that they're going to be red. And new bases will be laid down. Okay, so let me back up. In the Messelson and Stahl experiment, this parent DNA molecule is being represented with dark blue. So all of the bases here will be made up of heavy nitrogen. We split them and what's going to be laid down will be bases containing light nitrogen. So that's what that light blue stands for. And so if we look at our two um, uh, DNA strands, double stranded DNA strands here that are produced, we've got one old and one new strand. One new strand and one old strand. So it's semi-conservative. Okay, so I'm gonna take a break, pause this, go ahead and try to um, and try to answer this question, these questions. When you're done, you can resume. Okay, so a couple of questions before we move on, just to make sure that we're all together. Okay, so the first question. Messelson and Stahl's experiments proved that DNA replicates by which mode? Is it the conservative, the semi-conservative, the dispersive, or do none of these make sense? So which one did Messelson and Stahl's experiments um, prove to be true? So hopefully you answered semi-conservative. Remember, one old, one new strand. Okay, so that's semi-conservative replication. The next question, if the sequence of the five prime to three prime strand of DNA 
reads A-A-T-G-C-T-A-C. -A -A okay, so adenine, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, thymine, adenine, cytosine. What does the complementary DNA strand look like? How does it read? Is it, well, I'll let you guys read those. Go ahead, read them for a minute so I don't get tongue twisted. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about which one it is. So hopefully you picked green. So all of the answers here are anti-parallel, okay? But green is the only one that has the right complementary bases, right? So it would be three prime to five prime, anti-parallel. But our bases would be TT, right? Because thymine, thymine, that's gonna uh, complementary base pair at the two first adenines. And then A, because A to T, okay? And then CG, AT, G. Okay, so make sure you look and understand A to T, C to G. Okay, that's the complementary base pair rules. Remember also that between A and T, there's two hydrogen bonds, and between C and G, there's three hydrogen bonds. Okay, okay, let's go on. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how replication actually happens. Um, we know the semi conservative model was true. Let's talk about the nitty gritty now. What kinds of enzymes are involved here and what exactly happens? And so to do this, we're gonna study it in prokaryotes. So bacteria, very, very good model systems. As you can see, it's, they're used for all kinds of studies. They've been used by um, um, scientists throughout uh, um, time to, to, to look at um, DNA and to look at transformation and you can you just saw in the Messelson and Stahl experiments that they that bacteria again the model organism used to figure out that semi-conservative replication is what happens. So we're going to study this in prokaryotes. Um, prokaryotes like uh, you know bacteria a um, little bit different from eukaryotes, so they're a little bit different from us. We'll talk about us after, um, but we'll talk about prokaryotes first. They're a little simpler. Uh, instead of having, you know, in humans, we have 46 linear pieces of DNA, where prokaryotes are going to have usually just one circular piece of double-stranded DNA. So again, their genomes tend to be smaller. Some bacteria will also have plasmids, so it's not always just one circular piece of DNA. Sometimes there are some smaller circular pieces of DNA as well, but we're going to focus on the one chromosome. So bacterial genomes tend to be small, it's much smaller than organisms like us. And so replication um, is kind of easy to follow and it happens really rapidly. If you go back a few slides, let's actually do that Oop, here. If you didn't notice, when we talk about zero, you know, one round of replication, two rounds of replication, three rounds of replication, those are generations, right? Um, look at the time here. So E. coli can double, right? They can replicate in 20 minutes. That's fast. Their genomes must be pretty small. It takes our cells much longer. Ooh, going too fast. Okay. So prokaryotes, usually just one circular piece of double-stranded DNA. Genome is much smaller compared to ours. Replication is pretty rapid, so it's easy to study them. Um, it's also, because DNA replication is so rapid, um, it's much easier to establish mutant organisms in bacteria than it is to establish mutant organisms um, in eukaryotes. Okay, We'll talk about mutations a little bit after, too. So let's start at the beginning. Where does replication start? So it's going to start on DNA at a very specific location called the origin of replication. And in prokaryotes, there is just one site on the circular piece of DNA where that's going to start. In eukaryotes, like us, there's usually many. Um, and then from there, um, replication will start, and there's going to be a large number of proteins and enzymes that are involved in this process of initiation and, and, and all of the steps. We're going to cover some of them, but not all. We're going to try to keep it as simple as possible. So here's a short list of some enzymes that are going to become important. So first off is helicase. And so notice the ending ASE, it's an enzyme. 
and its job is to bind to the origin of replication. And after it binds, it's going to unwind and unzip the DNA. And what it's going to form is going to be two replication forks. Collectively, that whole region is going to be called a replication bubble. Okay, so helicase is an enzyme that binds to the origin of replication. It unwinds and it's going to unzip that double-stranded DNA molecule. And then after helicase does its job, you've got single-stranded DNA. And there's a tendency for those single strands to want to reseal or rehydrogen bond to each other. And so there's a second group of proteins. We call them SSBs. That stands for single-stranded binding proteins. And their job is going to be to bind to that single-stranded DNA and prevent it from rehydrogen bonding or resealing or reannealing. So it's going to keep them as single strands. And then one of my favorite enzymes is called topoisomerase. Topoisomerase is going to be an enzyme that is going to work kind of downstream of the replication bubble. And so you can, I'm not sure how many of you guys remember these or have these. Um, if you've ever had a, a, a telephone that had a cord attached to it, um, that cord tended to be wound up. And if you picture that as kind of the DNA uh, molecule, you know, it's, it was in a helical form, kind of wound up. If you've ever sat there on the phone, and um, I used to do this, and kind of pull on that as you're talking, and you, what you're doing is you're, you're uncoiling it, you're unwinding um, it. And if you've ever looked downstream or down past where you're actually pulling on that cord, you might have created some super coils or knots because of that unwinding that you were doing in that area. That can happen to DNA. So as it's being unwound, if you look down away from where replication is happening, there could be these super coils or these kinks or these knots that could form. And so topoisomerase is the enzyme there to, to fix that. So it's going to prevent overwinding of the DNA double helix. And if there is an overwinding event that happens or a knot that happens, it will actually physically break the DNA, get the kinks out, and then reseal it back up. It's a pretty cool enzyme. Okay, so before we go any further, let's take a look here. So we've got our double strand of DNA, and right here, these were together, this is the origin of replication. And so this is where helicase, shown in brown, would have bound and would have started to unwound, and now it's unzipping. So it's unzipping in this direction. It's also going to unzip in this direction. So it's bi-directional. Here is one replication fork, and here is the other replication fork. And collectively, this whole thing right here is called the replication bubble. Okay, what are these little green things that are bound? Those are those single-stranded binding proteins. And the, the little blue fork, uh, um, comb-like things here, these are all those nitrogenous bases. So these were together. Okay, and so we're unwinding the DNA. And again, preventing supercoiling is topoisomerase. And so the DNA will be unwound in this direction, and the DNA will be unwound in this direction as well. Okay, so here's some more enzymes. So DNA polymerase, which is also known as DNA pole. There's a couple of different types in prokaryotes, and we'll learn in eukaryotes there's actually a slew of different DNA polymerases. Um, so they're, they're named, uh, they're, they're numbered, um, and they're numbered on uh, based on uh, when they were actually um, and so DNA polymerase 1 and 2, um, they're actually going to be involved in DNA repair. And DNA polymerase 3 is going to be the major DNA polymerase involved in the direct replication of DNA. So DNA polymerase 3, the most important player here, it is going to read the DNA template strand, and it's going to add bases to the new strand in a complementary fashion. And it's always going to work in the five prime to three prime direction. One of the caveats, one of the downfalls of DNA polymerase is that it has to have a free three prime hydroxyl group to add the next DNA nucleotide to. 
If it doesn't have it, it doesn't work. So that creates a problem. If we look back here, um, there's no 3' prime hydroxyl group, right? We haven't started a DNA replication yet, so where the heck would that come from? So here's the next enzyme. And we need this in order for DNA polymerase to work. It's called primase. Primase does not require a free 3' prime end. Instead, um, it can actually just add bases um, right to, right complementary to, the template strand of DNA. The problem is primase can't lay down DNA bases. It can only lay down RNA bases. So it's going to lay down a short stretch of RNA molecules, which we're going to call the primer. And these RNA molecules that are going to be laid down, there will be a free 3' prime hydroxyl group. And that's going to give DNA polymerase an opportunity to come in and start to lay down DNA bases. Now we don't want RNA in our DNA. And so eventually as this process goes on, um, DNA polymerase 1 is going to come in and it's going to degrade the RNA primer, actually kind of pluck it off, and it will fill in the gaps with DNA bases instead. And there's another enzyme here called ligase. And ligase is going to come in and it's going to seal up the backbone. So anywhere on that double DNA strand um, that the backbone is not sealed up, covalently bonded, ligase will come in and fix that. And that's especially going to be especially apparent in regions where we remove RNA and add DNA. Ligase will have to work in those regions. Okay. So that brings us to leading and lagging strand. Okay, so your DNA is getting replicated. Now both strands, both template strands are going to be red. And both template strands are going to um, have a complementary strand laid down, okay, by DNA polymerase. Um, now, because the original DNA strands, those template DNA strands, they're anti-parallel to each other. And the new DNA polymerase, um, the new uh, DNA strand that's going to be laid down, has to be anti-parallel to the template. Well, here's another caveat of DNA polymerase. It can only work, right, in that 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and that's because it requires a free 3' prime end. So there ends up being one strand that is going to be read and copied continuously. That's going to be called the leading strand. And then there's going to be one strand that is not read continuously. Instead, it's read discontinuously. We're going to call that the lagging strand, and we'll get to that one on the next slide. The leading strand is much easier to understand, right? So what happens is RNA, prim or, sorry, primase comes in, it lays down a short RNA primer. That allows DNA polymerase to come in, and once it jumps on, it's just going to keep reading the DNA template and adding bases continuously into the replication fork. As the DNA gets unwound, it just continues down its path, right? The primer that was there in the very beginning, it gets degraded, and DNA um, is filled in by that DNA polymerase 1. And ligase, that enzyme, will then just seal the backbone. So it's pretty easy. Okay, Let's look at the leading strand. So here is the origin of replication right here. Okay, We're looking at just one half of the replication bubble to make it kind of simple. Helicase came in, it unwound the DNA and it unzipped it, and helicase would keep working in that direction, right? And so we look at um, our leading strand. Let's focus on this, kind of don't pay attention to this yet. So on our leading strand, RNA uh, primer was laid down here, so in red, primase came in, and it laid down a short stretch of primer, right, in the five prime to three prime direction, so right here, this base would have a free 3' prime hydroxyl group hanging off of it. And so that enables DNA polymerase to jump on here and to lay down in blue DNA nucleotides. And it's just going to keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going, keep going. This will be unwound and it'll just keep going. So that's the leading strand. The lagging strand is different. Because these are anti-parallel, 
And because DNA polymerase can only lay down bases in the five prime to three prime direction, DNA polymerase can't bind here and just go because DNA polymerase actually has to work in this direction, which is opposite of the unwinding here, right? So it's working this way. So we call this the lagging strand. And here's why. So picture this wound up to here. If the uh, replication fork was just open to here, then primase would come in, it would lay down a little primer, DNA polymerase would bind right here and start copying some of these bases, right, laying down these bases in a complementary fashion, and then it would stop. And then this would get unwound a little bit more, and primase would have to come back in and lay down this little stretch. And then DNA polymerase can come in and it can go from here to here, and eventually this primer comes off and this gets filled in with DNA, right? But the DNA polymerase can't do anything else until this gets unwound a little bit more, primer gets added, then DNA polymerase can come in and work and we can remove this primer. So on the lagging strand, it's discontinuous. We get these short stretches of DNA. Okay, and eventually again, we, we fill in the gaps. But this is called the lagging strand. These little fragments here of DNA, they get laid down discontinuously. They were, uh, this whole process was figured out um, by a scientist with a the last name Okazaki. And so these are called Okazaki fragments. So the lagging strand is gonna be made up of multiple Okazaki fragments that eventually get put together, right? So uh, DNA polymerase one comes in, it removes this, fills in the gaps, ligase comes in, it seals the backbone. But again, they're laid down discontinuously. So the leading strand is continuous DNA replication and the lagging strand is discontinuous replication. And again, that's all because DNA polymerase, right, the molecule doing the copying here, can only work in the five prime to three prime direction. So here's a nice figure to kind of show this. And so we've got our original DNA molecules here and here, and we've got um, helicase coming in and unwinding. Here's topoisomerase, uh, making sure that there's no super coils. We've got our single-stranded binding proteins that are holding this DNA together. Um, and in this case, the top strand is the lagging strand and the bottom strand is gonna be the leading strand. And so we had our primer and we had DNA polymerase three came on and here it goes. DNA polymerase is just chugging along and it's gonna keep going and keep going and keep going as the DNA gets unwound. That's nice and easy. This, there's continuous DNA replication. But on the lagging strand, because this was opened up in segments as helicase did its job unwinding, we end up with fragments. So here is one Okazaki fragment. And this looks like it was a second here. You can see the orange was um, primase. Here is the third Okazaki fragment being laid down. And it looks like primase did its job here, so we're gonna have our fourth Okazaki fragment will be here. Okay, so we end up with fragments, Okazaki fragments, discontinuous DNA replication. DNA polymerase one is coming in and it's filling in the gaps. DNA ligase is coming in and it is sealing up the backbone. So all of the, all of the RNA primers will end up getting removed and filled in um, with uh, DNA eventually. So there won't be any RNA in our DNA. Okay, so here's kind of an overview um, of this process. So again, we've got our origin of replication and we've got two forks. So this will be one fork and this is our second fork and DNA replication here um, in this fork on this top strand this would be the leading strand, con continuous replication. And down here would be discontinuous replication. It's actually the opposite on this other side of the fork because we're opening the DNA up in the opposite direction. So here the top strand is the lagging strand with Okazaki fragments, and the bottom strand becomes the continuous strand, right? And that's because we're unwinding in the opposite direction. There are, again, more video resources inside of your um, folder. Um, there's one done by the Amoeba Sisters. If you want to take a peek at that, that shows DNA replication. Um, and there's a couple of other ones as well there for you.
to look at. And so right here, you should pause um, the PowerPoint, go ahead and take a look at some of those video resources, and then go ahead and answer um, these questions. So just a couple questions for you before we move on. So first question, which of the following does the enzyme primase synthesize? Does primase make DNA primer, RNA primer, Okazaki fragments, or phosphodiester linkages? So think about that for a minute. What does primase lay down? So primase is going to lay down that short stretch of RNA primer. Remember that RNA primer is required for DNA polymerase to do its job because DNA polymerase requires a free three prime end. Okay, and that primer, even though it's RNA, is gonna provide that. Remember that primer comes off after and the space is filled in and ligase comes in and, and, and links the, um, the backbone, okay? But to begin, DNA polymerase requires an RNA primer. That's going to be laid down by the enzyme primase. The next question, in which direction does DNA replication take place? Does it occur in the five prime to three prime direction? The three prime to five prime direction? Five prime, three prime. So take a minute to think about that one. So remember that DNA replication, DNA is always synthesized or, or made or laid down in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, and that three prime end will be available for the DNA polymerase to lay down the next base. Okay, um, we say that DNA is read by um, DNA polymerase in the three prime to five prime direction, but it's the new strand is made or laid down um, in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, just a couple more. A scientist randomly mutates the DNA of a bacterium. She then sequences the bacterium's daughter cells and finds that the daughter cells have many errors in their replicated DNA. The parent bacterium likely acquired a mutation in which enzyme? DNA ligase, DNA polymerase II, primase, or DNA polymerase III? So hopefully you answer DNA polymerase too. Um, all of the DNA polymerases are, are involved in, in proofreading. Um, DNA polymerase one and two uh, really have that function where DNA polymerase three is one that lays down new bases. Okay, next question. The region of DNA where replication begins is called the, is it called the origin of replication, the start site, the promoter region, or the tata -ta box? So that region is called the origin of replication. Okay, so we're going to go on. And so you finished those questions. We're going to move on um, to looking at eukaryotic DNA replication. And it's essentially the same. Here's some key differences. So first off, eukaryotic genomes tend to be much more complex and larger in size. So again, instead of one circular chromosome, now, humans have 46 linear chromosomes, so a lot more information to copy. Um, origin of replication in bacteria with circular chromosomes, there tends to be one origin of replication, where in humans, we can have up to 100,000 origins of replication. That's going to help um, eukaryotic uh, replication to be quicker still not as quick as what we see in prokaryotes. So in prokaryotes, because their genomes are small um, and less complex, they tend to have very fast and efficient DNA replication. Again, when we compare that to organisms like us, humans, DNA replication in us is much, much slower. In prokaryotes, there's just three types of DNA polymerase, where in eukaryotes, there's at least 14, and we're probably not done um, in that area of research with finding those. Um, so DNA polymerase is more complex, and there are more of them. But the essential steps of replication 
are basically the same. Okay. Here's a problem. So in prokaryotes, again, they have a circular piece of DNA, and so the entire genome gets copied. But in eukaryotes, where we have linear chromosomes, if we look at the lagging strand, at the very end of the lagging strand, when that RNA primer gets degraded, there is no three prime end for DNA polymerase to bind to. And so with every round of replication, the lagging strand gets a little bit shorter. The leading strand would remain unpaired, and so the leading strand could end up also getting degraded. So we could lose information at the ends of our chromosomes. And it's been hypothesized um, that again, with each round of cell division, with each round of mitosis, that our chromosomes, the ends of our chromosomes, get shorter and shorter. And if there's genetic information at the end of those chromosomes, we could lose it. And so at the ends, and actually towards the middle of our chromosomes as well, there are these structures called telomeres. And telomeres are gonna be repetitive sequences that again are at the ends of our chromosomes that we don't think code for anything. They're highly repetitive. They get added to the ends of chromosomes. We think that that's so that we don't lose genetic information. So again, with each round of cell division, if our chromosomes get shorter, that could create a problem. We could start to lose genes. And if those genes are important genes, which most genes are important, we, we, would, we would lose them. That, would be, that could be very detrimental. And so these things called telomeres at the ends of our genes, um, again, they lengthen our chromosomes so that we do not lose pertinent genetic information. Okay? Okay, so what didn't I say here? So again, they limit the amount of genes or coding regions that get lost during DNA replication. And here's the enzyme. The enzyme is called telomerase. Um, it is an enzyme that adds these repetitive sequences, these telomeres. And in 2009, not too long ago, um, a scientist by the name of Elizabeth Blackburn, she was awarded the Nobel Prize for finding this enzyme and for figuring out what the enzyme does. It's pretty cool. So here it is. So this would be our leading strand, and this would be our lagging strand. And so you can see that there's a five prime end here, but no three prime end for DNA polymerase to actually finish its job here. There's this overhang of bases that we don't have a complement for in our new strand. And so this is the enzyme telomerase. And so what telomerase does is it's going to provide bases for DNA polymerase to lengthen the leading strand. So DNA polymerase can still go here as a free three prime end. And so it will, it will extend out this end and that's going to allow for primer and DNA bases to be laid down here on the lagging strand. And so here, if this doesn't get copied, well, who cares? This isn't part of the genome. This was extended due to the telomerase. And so we extend these repetitive non-coding sequences to the ends of our chromosomes to save genes. Now, telomerase, the enzyme responsible for this, is highly active in germ cells and in adult stem cells. Okay, so cells that you know start off life, those are called germ cells. And if we look at adult stem cells, those cells that are um, going to give rise to new cells, um, those are going to have active telomerase activity. But if we look at adult somatic cells, so body cells that aren't germ cells, that aren't stem cells, so that most of the cells in our bodies, what we find is as we age, telomerase activity starts to go down, starts to decrease. And so as we age, our chromosomes shorten. And so it's thought that maybe age is due to the loss of telomeres. Maybe we're starting to lose genes at the ends of those chromosomes. The question is, is that's what causes aging? 
or is it just part of the aging process and we're not sure. And there's been studies that have been done um, in mice that are pretty promising that show that if we actually increase telomerase activity later in life, we might be able to reverse some age-related conditions. Okay, those are still being studied, um, but they look pretty promising. Interestingly, if we look at cancer cells, right, cancer is the result of the cell cycle gone mad, right? And so cancer cells just kind of continuously divide and divide and divide and divide and divide. Um, and cancerous cells, when we look inside of them, they tend to have shortened telomeres. So there's genetic information maybe starting to be missing from the ends of the chromosomes. However, they also have high telomerase activity. It's kind of counterintuitive and strange. And what we think is that telomerase activity was actually low, but then it spiked after the chromosomes got shortened. And we think that maybe if we target telomerase, if we actually inhibit telomerase activity specific to those cells, we might be able to actually stop cell division. That's a potential drug therapy that uh, we're looking at to, to fight cancer. So pretty interesting. Okay, DNA repair. So first off, DNA replication is highly, highly accurate. However, mistakes do occur. And sometimes those mistakes are fixed, and sometimes they're not. And so if there's a mistake in DNA replication that does not get fixed, that would be a mutation. And when we hear mutation, sometimes we think bad, but we're gonna find that not all mutations are bad. Mutations um, can actually lead to genetic variation which actually could enhance the likelihood of, a sur of survival of a species. So we'll get into that in the next couple of chapters after this next test. So it's highly accurate, and DNA polymerase has actually has built-in proofreading capabilities. So as it's laying down bases, it's actually gonna check itself before it lays down the next base. And if a mistake is found, it will correct itself. Okay. Now, there are some errors that are not caught, caught by DNA polymerase as it's proofreading. And therefore, they may not be corrected right there and then by DNA polymerase 3. And so instead, after replication is finished, other enzymes might have to come in and actually fix things. Okay, so that's called mismatch repair. So you can see right here, there was a G in the original parent strand, and DNA polymerase laid down a T. And so we know that's not good, right? A to T, C to G, this should have been a C. And so these mismatch repair enzymes will come in, and they will physically cut out the thymine. They will put in the correct base, cytosine. And then um, DNA ligase will come in and actually ligate the backbone again. These mismatch repair enzymes, they know not to cut the parent strand and to cut the daughter strand instead because parental DNA um, will get uh, chemically modified so that these enzymes know which strand is old or original and which strand is new. Okay, um, here's another example of, you know, DNA replication is finished um, or not happening at all. Um, an individual is exposed to UV radiation and DNA gets damaged. Okay, so right here, um, the sequence of bases is fine, um, but what we have here is we have this region here from, from UV radiation where it's damaged. These bases are not pairing up properly. Um, instead, these cre have created a dimer, which means that they're attracted to each other, and that's a problem, right? And if this DNA were to get copied, uh, it may not get copied properly, and so it, 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 it may lead to future mutations as well. And so your cells don't like that. So you have enzymes that are constantly surveying the DNA to make sure damage has not been done. This is called nucleotide excision repair. Right, so actually fixing the DNA. 
um, what will happen is we'll have enzymes that come in and they'll cut out the damaged DNA, usually a segment, maybe a little bit larger. They cut this out and then um, DNA polymerase will come in and it will fill in the missing bases and DNA ligase comes in and seals the backbone. Okay, so and that would be either DNA polymerase one or two. Um, they have um, the capability to do that fixing. Okay, um, we talked about both of those. Okay, so what if a mutation does occur? What if there's a problem um, and it doesn't get fixed? Okay, so here's the definition of a mutation, a basic definition. This is going to be variations in the nucleotide sequence, the sequence of the bases of a genome. Some mutations are spontaneous. We're not sure what causes them, but for some reason a mutation pops up. So there's no environmental agent that causes them. And then some mutations are caused by exposure to chemicals, UV rays, x-rays, or some type of other um, environmental agent. Um, known carcinogens would fit into this category of being able to cause induced mutations. Now these mutations will only be heritable if they happen in sex cells, right? And so you're only able to pass on a mutation if it happens in one of your um, one of your gametes. And some mutations, we again we're thinking of these as terrible things. Some mutations um, are silent; they have no effect. Um, they actually some might be benefit beneficial. They might actually prove beneficial in a different environment. So here's some different types of mutations. So the first is a point mutation. And by the way, there's a video on this as well if you'd like to watch it. A point mutation. When you think of point mutation, this is a, um, a single base pair that gets affected. This might be a substitution, an insertion, or a deletion. And so a substitution, this is when one base is replaced by another. This is the most common. This can be a transition substitution or a transverse substitution. So in a transition, transition substitution, it's a purine or, or pyrimidine being replaced by the same kind of base. So for example, instead of laying down an, an A, um, DNA polymerase lays down um, a G. Okay, so a purine for a purine. A got replaced by G. Or maybe some type of a chemical exposure happened and a T was chemically changed and now it's a C. So that would be a pyrimidine for a pyrimidine. A transverse substitution is usually much worse. This is when a purine is replaced by a pyrimidine or vice versa. And again, the sizing of these bases is really important to maintain DNA structure. And so replacing a base with a base of a different size can be very detrimental. An insertion is an addition of a base, and a deletion is the removal of a base. And that can screw up DNA sequencing for a gene. Um, this last type here, a translocation, this is when a piece of DNA from one chromosome is physically translocated, moved to another chromosome or another part of that same chromosome. Okay, just to show you some effects of mutations. So some point mutations are silent. They have no effect on the protein sequence that's going to be produced in the end. Okay, so let's look here. Um, this DNA is supposed to read AGC, GTA, okay, CCC, TAC. And so if this was our DNA, um, then our protein sequence after translation would read uh, serine, valine, proline, tyrosine. So these are the four amino acids that would be coded for according to this DNA sequence. And so if we replaced this adenine right here with a thymine, which is shown here, this would have no effect because GTT also codes for phthalene, just like GTA did. So this is a silent mutation. Yes, there was a change in the base at that position, but there was no uh, change in the protein, in the amino acid sequence of the protein. 
and so the protein stays the same and therefore it would function the same. Here is something called a missense mutation. And in a missense mutation, this is a change again in the DNA, it's a point mutation. And that does result in an amino acid substitution. So let's look here at this position. It's supposed to be cytosine. And so CCC would code for proline here. But instead we have adenine. So now it reads ACC. That doesn't code for proline. Instead that codes for threonine. And so that's a protein that doesn't have the right amino acid sequence. And it depends on the rest of that amino acid sequence. It might not do anything, but it might. It all depends. Um, and this last type of point mutation is a nonsense mutation. So this is a substitution. And what ends up happening is we have a, we have a stop codon instead of an amino acid. And so that's right here. This is supposed to be cytosine, and so TAC codes for threonine, or sorry, tyrosine. And instead here, we have a G, and so that's TAG, and now that codes for stop. And so now instead of having the appropriate length protein, we have a truncated version. So this stop would cause the protein um, to stop being made, and therefore we would have a shortened or truncated protein. And again, that could be really bad. It depends on where that stop codon ends up. If it's at the very beginning, you have a non-functional protein. If it happens towards the very end, it might not have too much um, of an effect. Depends on the protein. These tend to be real bad. So a frame shift mutation. This is when you have an insertion or a deletion of nucleotides that may result in the shift of a whole reading frame, or you may end up with the insertion of a stop codon. So this is the original. It's supposed to be AGC, CTA, but this T and A, they get deleted. And so all of these now shift down. And so if, instead of having serine, valine, proline, tyrosine, now, since all of this from this C, cytosine, on over, they all shifted down two bases, now we have serine, valine, leucine, leucine, totally different amino acid sequence. And so this would usually be pretty bad. It depends, again, on where in the gene this happens. Um, if it happens towards the very beginning, real bad. If it happens towards the end, usually not, not too bad. Um, but again, when I say very bad towards the beginning of a gene, what I mean is that the protein that was supposed to be the product, it won't be that protein. And so that could be very bad for the cell, or maybe it's a new protein. So here is your last Are You With Me? You're going to want to pause this here and go ahead and answer these questions. And then come back on because I have a couple of questions for you that we'll do together. Okay, so you've hopefully finished the Are You With Me? The last Are You With Me? Um, you're going to want to go ahead and uh, upload that to Blackboard. Okay. Um, but before you do that, let's answer these couple questions together. So the first one, the ends of the linear chromosome are maintained by, is that enzyme called helicase, primase, DNA polymerase, or telomerase? And so that enzyme is called telomerase. And that's the enzyme that's going to lengthen the ends of our linear chromosomes, making sure that the important genetic information doesn't get um, deleted over time, okay? Because remember, the ends of chromosomes shorten over time without that enzyme, without telomeres, okay? Next question. Which of the following is not a true statement comparing prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA replication? So in pink, both eukaryotic and prokaryotic DNA polymerases build off RNA primers made by primase. Blue, eukaryotic DNA replication requires multiple replication forks, while prokaryotic replication uses a single origin to rapidly replicate the entire genome. Green, DNA replication always occurs in the nucleus or yellow, eukaryotic DNA replication involves more polymerases 
than prokaryotic replication. Okay, so which is not a true statement. Okay, so for both prokaryotic and eukaryotic, hopefully you chose uh, green because prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus. And so how would DNA replication occur inside of one of those if they don't have it? Okay, all of the other statements here are true. Okay, next slide. Hopefully you can see all of these. So during proofreading, which of the following enzyme reads the DNA, primase, topoisomerase, DNA polymerase, or helicase? Which one of these is involved in proofreading? Okay, remember proofreading is part of um, you know, fixing mistakes, finding and fixing mistakes. That would be DNA polymerase, right? Helicase is involved in DNA replication or um, transcription, right? It's going to unwind the DNA. Primase is involved in laying down that RNA primer during DNA replication. And topoisomerase is the enzyme responsible for preventing supercoiling. Okay? But DNA polymerase, and there are multiple DNA polymerase enzymes, uh, but DNA polymerase is involved in laying down new DNA bases and also involved in DNA proofreading. Next question. Mutations are... Are they always caused by environmental factors? Are they always lethal? Green, are they only heritable? So can they only be passed on from parent to offspring if they occur in cells that produce gametes? Or are they heritable uh, only if they occur in somatic cells? And somatic cells are body cells, or gametes are sex cells. So hopefully you chose green. Okay, so they're only going to be heritable, passed on from parent to offspring, if they occur in cells that produce egg or sperm cells. Okay, that concludes the chapter. So again, you want to make sure that you upload um, your Are You With Me's right to Blackboard. Uh, and you can go ahead and you can take your quiz now.